Deep in the gloom of these Scottish caves are messages from one of the most enigmatic peoples ever to live in Britain. This is just one of many symbols carved by the Picts, a people who so worried the Romans that they built Hadrian's Wall just to keep them out. But that's just part of these caves' colourful history. Over the centuries, Jacobite aristocracy, World War II refugees, even hermits have all sought shelter here. But now they're under threat. Rising sea levels mean it's only a matter of time before they succumb to the dark, cold Firth of Forth. And that's why we're here, to glean as much evidence as we can from these caves' rich past before it's too late. And we've got just three days to do it. The term Picts describes the people who lived in northern Scotland from the 4th to 9th century AD. Their name comes from the Latin Picti, meaning painted people, and they've fascinated historians and artists for centuries, despite leaving virtually no written history. The Picts' real legacy is their art, intriguing designs that have never been deciphered and there's an unusually high number of them here in the Weems Caves on the very edge of the Pictish nation. We've got a stand here. Is that a Pictish name? Not as far as I know, no. No, that's not a Pictish name. But we do have some classic Pictish symbols here. This double disc symbol here is a classic one. What's this one here? Well, that's a salmon. Again, that's probably original. It's probably Pictish, and it's probably dates from perhaps about the 7th or 8th century AD. But this fish over here... What, what this one down here? That one there. It's quite different nature and character, and that's probably 19th century in date. We've got 1,500 years or more of carving straight in front of us here. This wall is a chronicle of centuries of human activity here. But we're going to concentrate on these mysterious symbols and the people who made them. The carvings represent years of Pictish presence at Weems, and we want to discover if this cave was a communal art gallery or if the Picts who left these marks actually lived here. If they did, we should find some evidence of occupation charcoal, animal bones, cereal grains and the like. But first we need to find the 1,500-year-old surface on which they would have stood to carve these designs. We'll get this modern disturbance yeah. off. Let's, let's call it the party lair. The party. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll get down onto some serious archaeology. Okay. <laughs> but we're going to have our work cut out. The 1,500 years of human activity here have featured periods of later occupation, industry and, unfortunately, vandalism, including one case when a car was driven into this cave and set alight. How far down do you think the pigs might be? Well, anywhere within possibly several metres to the bottom of the, 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 the cave floor. It could be a long way down. We would expect a great sandwich of occupation of different periods. You know, people come in, there's been stuff washed in, probably stuff dumped, and then more people living on top. It'd be a great sandwich underneath us. So it could be some dig? Yeah. And we might find a Ford Escort at the bottom. Well, it might. <laughs> <laughs> the trench Phil's digging is in Jonathan's cave named after a 19th century man who made it his home. And it's just one of several caves at Weems that not only contain Pictish carvings, but seem to encapsulate centuries, even millennia, of Scottish history. But all the archaeology along this coastline is now seriously at risk from rising sea levels and unstoppable coastal erosion. And that's why we've decided that this dig has to be a multi-period excavation. This is probably the last chance to record the heritage of the Weems Caves, and every one has its own story to tell. Our next target is the Well Cave, which lies underneath the remains of the medieval Macduff's Castle. 
As well as a rumour of a secret tunnel connecting the cave to the castle, it's also believed that from the 10th to the 15th century, this was home to Christian hermits. This is a big open area. Yes, yeah, about huge. 12 metres in diameter. It's high too. Yeah, yeah. How long have you got the inscriptions on that side? Well, they date from about 1860, 1861. These carvings may be more recent, but they do have a special significance for the archaeologists on the dig. They're from the mid-19th century, when Weems became a popular Victorian attraction, as antiquarians, the forerunners of today's archaeologists, began to uncover the cave's rich history. Unfortunately, some of the methods used in the investigations were far from ideal. Uh, archaeology at this, this period wasn't really a science. It, it wasn't a subject that really came into existence. These were learned gentlemen who were inquiring about Scotland's past, and their qualifications was essentially uh, to be a gentleman and to have the money to indulge their passion and interest. Do we have any idea if they found any finds in those digs? Well, yes and no. Well, the records from those early um, explorations show that a number of finds were made, ceramics and a few other iron objects, but the descriptions and so on they gave them were relatively poor and these artefacts weren't actually collected. The technology and methods being used today are a bit more sophisticated. As part of an ongoing project implemented by Fife Council, the caves are now being digitally mapped. We're getting a scan of about five millimetre resolution here. Oh, a, a point every five millimetres? Yeah. The laser scanning will create a high definition model of the caves, hoarding them for posterity. And once the well cave has been scanned, we're going to put in a couple of trenches for our own investigation. Oh, what's that? Over in Jonathan's cave, Phil and Rakshaw are finally through the layer of 20th century rubbish and appear to have found well, some earlier rubbish. That ain't the sort of thing you have at a party, is it? No, not, not loads, really. Loads of wire. So, I mean, that could be where, where somebody's been yeah. living in here. Yeah. It looks like Phil has hit an occupation layer, but unfortunately, these finds are much too late to be Pictish. So far, the only evidence we have of these elusive people are the carvings. Who were these people who were doing the carving? They were simply the descendants of the Celtic tribes whom the Romans encountered when they marched into Scotland in AD 79. Uh, and it's sometimes argued that it was the threat of the Roman presence that made the small Celtic tribes come together uh, into a single kingdom of the Picts in order to be stronger. So, although a lot of these drawings would have been post-Roman. Actually, there are echoes of really old times here. Yes, they are. And what's interesting about the caves is that it is the early forms of the symbols that you get. As time goes on into the 8th, 9th centuries, you get really elaborate versions, but these are dead simple. The most beautiful examples of Pictish art come from standing stones found elsewhere in Scotland but they do have something in common with these roughly hewn symbols at Weems. They've confounded academics for centuries. Do we know what they mean? No, no, we don't. Uh, clearly, they're a means of communication. Um, a passing pick would know what they meant, but we don't, because there are no documents. And there's no equivalent of, of something like the Rosetta Stone, where you have two languages saying the same thing. One which we know, one which we didn't, That's so we can right. work out what the other one means. Yes. Oh, oh, you're, hey, oh. The house, oh, that's iron, isn't it? Yeah. Oh. It could be a long time before we reach any sort of okay. Pictish archaeology. That's a big old nail, isn't it? Yeah. Phil and co are still trawling through an inordinate amount of ironwork. It's a cut nail. We'd imagine it's 19th century, perhaps even earlier. What do you think that was used for, then? Holding two big bits of wood together. Yeah. I shouldn't wonder, well, that is big bits of wood. <laughs> Oh, everyone, watch yourselves. It's really dark in here. Are you guys all right following through? Yeah. Cool. Oh. But over at the well cave, the laser scanning has finished, and Bridge and Matt can now start work on the medieval period of Weems history. Oh, wow. wow. Look at that. It's awesome. <laughs> 
That is incredible. Our first trench in here will investigate the well that gave the cave its name. And in particular, Bridge will be looking for any evidence of medieval occupation, the period when hermits are believed to have lived here. Is this, this is the well then over here? I yeah, guess. this is the well over here. So the first trench is going to be around this? It's going to come straight out here, I guess about a metre extending from, yeah. see the set stones here? Yeah. All the way around. Set around the edge. The other intriguing aspect of the well cave is this tunnel, which, according to folklore, leads to the 15th century Macduff's castle, over 20 metres above our diggers. But in its current state, it doesn't look a particularly welcoming proposition. It's now down to Matt to try and find archaeological evidence of a medieval man-made passageway. We're going to put a trench sort of against that wall there, Not halfway going, into it, yeah, and let's see if we get it. Let's see we get some evidence that people made that hole. The historical period we're investigating may be vast, some 1,500 years or more, but in geological terms, the Weems Caves are young whippersnappers, cut from sandstone in the last 10,000 years. I always think of caves as being almost as old as the earth itself. <laughs> the idea that people were around when they were being created and moved in practically straight away is quite bizarre. It is, isn't it? I mean, 10,000 years ago, this was at the water's edge. You know, the sea was bashing against this. It was totally inhospitable, as it were. But about 6,500 years ago, there was a change. The ice sheets started to melt. And as they melted, the weight was reduced and the land started to, to rise out of the water, lifting these up onto dry land. You can see here the, the layers of rock, these sandstone layers, they're very soft. And as the, the sea pounds against it, it breaks little bits off along these joints here. And every bit it breaks off, it then bashes further against the rock and knocks another bit off. So you get this like, it's like a huge tumble dryer of pebbles and rocks going round and round and round and scouring into the rock. If you look, you see just up there on that shelf, can you see there's a whole load of pebbles just there? Yeah, yeah. That, that's almost just a remnant of that last process of the <laughs> sea coming in here. Those pebbles are jammed into that rock. Give them a few more years, those pebbles would have brought down that ledge as they were swirled around. The cave would have got bigger. In Jonathan's cave, Mick has decided to open up another trench in the search for Pictish evidence. It would be nice if one of them gave us a result, if only. In Phil's trench, the expected two metres of archaeology with a nice Pictish floor at the bottom has spectacularly failed to materialise. Doesn't actually sound to me like evidence of Pictish habitation. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds to me like bedrock, Tony, and that's exactly what it is. We've basically got two layers. We've got a, a layer up to this dark line here. Can you see that dark yep, line mm, yep. across there? Now, we've actually got a piece of pot from around there, which we think might actually be 17th century. No, I so, in other words, that could be part of our Jacobite aristocracy yeah. that, we're, that, that, that we know lived in here. But above it, we've got... Gosh! <laughs> <laughs> So what, what, what's happening here then? Well, actually, this was the cave was once used as a, a nail making oh, workshop. Yes. I mean, there is very, very little stratigraphy here. So does that mean the Picts who carved these things were extremely small? <laughs> or well, laying down? I, I yeah. mean, the, the only way, the only way in which you could actually carve that is either to be extremely small or simply to get down here and work like yeah. that. Yeah. The second trench in Jonathan's cave has fared little better. It would seem that the Picts who created these designs came, carved and left again. There's no evidence that they lived here. It's a disappointing end for a cave that promised so much. But at least we still have the Well Cave. Look, this is extraordinary. Yeah, mind your head tone. Yeah, well, it's like a mini cathedral. It's fantastic, in isn't it? Like a proper cave should be. How have you been getting on? <laughs> All right, we've got a couple of things going on here. Bridget's over there, look. Bridge, what have you got? Well, it looks like we're inside of the well here. Um, it, Tom's following round the curving edge. Inside it looks to be redeposited rubble, really, and we're finding crisp packets and paint tins. But he has just said that he's come down onto a new layer which does have some archaeological promise. How about you, Matt? Well, we haven't got any finds as yet, but just below the surface, 
the edge of the cave is dead straight and drops down completely vertically. So it looks like it could be man-made. We're going to follow that round and see if it joins up with the tunnel there. Mick, it does seem as though we've been working all day and we're still just scratching away at cave floors. Yeah, I mean, there's been an awful lot of rubble and soil and stuff to ship, but I think we're in a position to get down into the archaeology. We won't do much in Jonathan's cave. I think we're almost finished there. But here, there's everything to go for. So we hit this hard tomorrow. I think so, yeah. And in addition, we've been looking in a third cave where there seem to be many more layers below the floor surface. And most importantly, one of our archaeologists has discovered some ancient kind of engraving which no one's ever seen before. Before. So we're going to get the specialists in first thing tomorrow morning to see if we've got our first ever Time Team Pictish carving. Yesterday morning we came here to the Fife Coast to look at some caves which have been inhabited on and off for thousands of years. The first one we looked at was Jonathan's cave, way back there, and there's some great Pictish carvings on the walls, but we put a couple of trenches in and we haven't found anything particularly exciting. But one of our archaeologists was footling around down this cave and came up with something which everyone thinks could be really exciting. And obviously it had to be in another cave that's a bit of a squeeze to get into. But tackling the appropriately named sloping cave is well worth the effort. We think it's a serpent. You can see kind of this head hole here and then the body curving around like this. And we, we thought, you know, it's probably a Pictish carving. How do we know it's Pictish? Well, we've had an expert looking at it. Anna Ritchie herself has actually seen it and said, yeah, there's no doubt about it, it is Pictish. The beauty of it is, look how low down in the cave it is. So, in fact, there's no way that you could actually make that carving with a ground level at this, at this point. There must be quite a lot of build-up of actual deposits with possible Pictish material in it. Well, we said that yesterday, but maybe this time Phil will find an identifiable Pictish layer. But the Pictish heritage of these caves is just part of a much bigger survey of this coastline, which is now under serious threat from rising sea levels. In the well cave underneath the castle, Bridge and Matt are in the midst of a medieval excavation uncovering the eponymous well that may have been used by Christian hermits and investigating a mysterious passage that runs into the cave wall. How are you getting on? Pretty well, actually. We've got this medieval jug handle, probably about 13th to 14th century. It's great. And that came from the lucid deposits up here, right next to the, uh, the, the tunnel opening. So that's pretty good for explaining a link between the castle up there and, uh, and this cave. They may be chucking rubbish down here or there's something joining up the two there, but I still want to get a camera down there, if, if possible. Yeah, but every single tunnel in the world, people say, it goes to the nearby yeah, castle. Yeah, a castle or a priory or a church. Yeah. Uh, maybe this one really does, you can't tell. Come over and have a look at uh, what Bridge is doing. Ooh, you're certainly on a different layer than you were last night. Yeah, not very far down still yet. <laughs> what we seem to be finding here is um, interleaving layers of cobble and soil trample that people would have brought into the cave on the bottom of their shoes and left it. And then you've also got evidence of people not being in the cave. You've got sort of decayed sandstone that's been washed down by water in between the episodes of people coming in here. Can you date the well? Not yet. We're going to have to keep digging and keep going down because we are on a nice organic layer that looks pretty undisturbed. There's clearly a lot more work to be done in here, but that hasn't stopped us searching for new targets outside the caves. 45, can't do good. Nice to have such power. This plateau of land has been savagely eroded, and a trench at the very edge of it has provided county archaeologist Douglas Spears with a stratigraphy of centuries of human activity, including lots of rubbish from the castle. Just a few years ago, this land surface went way out beyond us. I mean, this whole section of coast is so unstable. It's currently eroding at several metres a year. What would you expect to find in layers like this, on the beach like this? Well, I said, what I think we're dealing here is with a medieval midden. When I say a medieval midden... It's sort of dumped food remains. It's the rubbish from the kitchen. It's the old bones from the dinner table. We could actually find just about anything in this midden. So we've got to come back when they've done a bit more cleaning and see what they've got then? Very much so. We now want to find out what was happening out here and relate it to what was going on in the caves. 
And that's all the more important because Phil has just uncovered even more evidence of the Picts' habit of leaving messages in the sandstone. This one is the original serpent yeah. coming in there, but we've actually got a brand spanking new one. Look, it's coming down there and almost mirrors oh. the curve on that one there. I mean, it, it's just such amazing to me because I mean, what you're looking at is, well, not only brand spanking new carvings, but look at the condition of the rock face. It's totally unweathered. That, I'm sure, is the way that the Picts would have seen it when they actually, re actually carved it. It's brilliant. And there's no sign that you're anywhere near the bedrock there. Not at the moment, no. no. What's really interesting about these is that these carvings haven't been tampered with in recent times, like most of the other carvings in the other caves. Yeah. Um, but also, when you look at that one, it's smoothed. You know, it's been pecked first and then it's been ground down nice and smooth. So that's finished carving. Oh, right. Whereas that double disc over the other side what, of the What, this cave, one over here? Yes. This one? Well, so that's they, it. They never finished that one then? Well, you can still see the pecking on that. They never oh, got round right. to smoothing it out. Purely in terms of Pictish archaeology, this is a great find. But in another sense, it's a deeply frustrating discovery. No one knows what it or any of the other Pictish symbols mean, and the Picts themselves are just as mysterious. This is a picture of the Pictish man recreated by Victor, and this is a picture of a Pictish woman from the early 16th century. Oh, right. uh, I thought what they demonstrate for me is this wide variety in images of who these people might be. Why don't we know more about them? The problem is, uh, to date and in the past, we've only had a few sources of information to, to examine them, or certainly that only a few have been exploited. For example, a very colourful but one-sided picture is given from the early historical uh, records we have from the Roman writers about the Picts, and this is likely to be a biased source of information. We do have quite a, a good visual impression of them. Um, we know what sort of things they ate. We know the names of their kings. But it is, it is that whole process of, of putting together, you know, an earlier people, which archaeologists have had to do time and time again, isn't it? Yeah. You start with the standing remains, the, the ruins, you dig on the sites, you find, as you're saying, evidence of diet and that sort of stuff. Yes. And then there's this, another stage of thinking, well, yes, but what were they actually like? Were they warlike? Were they builders? Were they farmers? I think it's likely that excavation or more excavation of Pictish sites is what's required because, for example, here in Fife, with the exception of the work we're doing now, there's only really been one sizeable excavation of a Pictish site actually in Fife. So it seems utterly almost bizarre that we have this group of people inhabiting Scotland or a large chunk of Scotland for so long and all we really know about them is they had a particularly distinctive artistic style. But at the moment, the symbols are the only thing we have to go on, and they don't just appear on rocks, because the Picts are also famous for their jewellery. There was a remarkable find in Fife, about 12 kilometres away from the Weems Caves, at a place called Norrie's Law. So what happened to it? Oh, oh, it's a tragic tale, because about 400 ounces of silver were found. Um, unfortunately, the uh, people didn't want them to fall into the hands of the crown, treasure trove. And they actually sold them to a peddler, who then sold them to a jeweller in Cooper, and he melted them down oh, and made them into spoons. Well, no such blasphemy from us, but we are going to try and recreate one of these pendants using methods from the time and one of the original designs. The objects themselves have left some clues, so what they must have done is to start off by making an ingot of silver, and then they would hammer that ingot flat and they would shape it into the leaf shape, and you can tell that because these are hammer marks on the back. They would have flipped it over, given it a light polish, and then engraved the decoration, then they would have enamelled it and then give it a final polish. So there's actually quite a complicated number of stages in it. Absolutely, requiring a great deal of skill as well. In the sloping cave, Phil's search for Pictish occupation is starting to uncover a lot of bone, although it's too early to say what period it belongs to. And something else has been discovered in this cave, but this time it's not Pictish, and for once we can translate it. So what, what is that sort of Y-shaped, fork-shaped 
It's the thing that we're looking at. It's a very distinctive Norse or Viking rune. Oh, crikey. But, I mean, is, is it what you'd expect to find in a cave like this? You expect to find anything. And we know that there was Norse activity in this area. Well, which letter is it? It's the letter K. It's the sixth letter in cool. the alphabet. And what's interesting is that um, the first six letters spell Futhuk, a, a sort of magical formula. It's oh, almost nice. as if I were to say, uh, God bless you, or yeah. praise be to Allah, yeah. or something like yeah. that. This is a timely reminder that these caves contain centuries of history. And in the well cave, Matt's trying to discover if he's got a tunnel leading to the medieval castle or if he's just busting a gut to debunk a local myth. And he's now employed the very latest in technology, cave cam, which is basically a camcorder in a plastic tray strapped to a couple of fence posts. I think if we get I another think, bit of wood... I we... think maybe, yeah, we should get another bit of wood and make it a little bit longer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't born to be a gaffer tape woman, Matt. <laughs> there we go. That's uh, beautiful. Yeah. Lovely. <laughs> Talk about amateurs! <laughs> the initial results from this cutting-edge technology aren't promising. It would seem the tunnel story is literally coming to a dead end. Outside the well cave, John's now finished his survey, and he's established a couple of targets that might help tie together the different strands of our archaeological investigation. What we have got in the results is an area of increased noise. And that may be something, or it may not. So we're going to put a trench in over that. It's just going to be a very, very small trench, basically, probably only about a couple of bucket widths, just to see what John's anomaly is, whether it is actually anything or a load of pebbles. The strategy is start there first yeah. and then hopefully move close to the cave entrance. Start yeah. where first? Well, actually, down here we've marked out the trench. This is where the noise is on the geophysics. Yeah. But we're quite a long way from the cave. So, really, what we want to do is, if Rod's happy, is cut back some of the nettles, get a bit closer to the entrance and maybe put something in there, as Rod just said. He's not shaking his head. <laughs> I'm thinking. <laughs> now, I think it's OK if we don't not take all the, the cover away from the cave mouth. So you can get in quite a long way in and I hopefully tie up the stratigraphy between the, the cave area and, and, out, and the outside. Will that do for you? Yeah, and it's an opportunity to work in the sun. <laughs> so far, this site has given us three distinct periods to investigate. But this trench here on the plateau could present us with evidence dating right back to the formation of these caves thousands of years ago. That's an awful lot of archaeology from a rather small trench. With just a few hours of day two left, this multi-period, multi-site dig has taken on a life of its own. It's a shell. With each trench supplying different but vital information for the history of Weems Caves. And our attempt to recreate a Pictish pendant is also doing pretty well. It's starting to look more like an object you'd recognise, Alison. That's right, yes, yeah. I mean, when they're found, they would be um, corroded, but certainly shape-wise and smoothness-wise, yes, it's more like the ingots that we know. On the plateau, the digger has gone through over two metres of earth, including a rather impressive midden layer of dumped organic material. And it's now hitting sand. Just coming onto the beach. All right. See a sandcastle. We'll stop there then. It's now down to environmental archaeologist Dr. Erica Goodman to make sense of it. So, do you think that definitely is beach? Yeah, we've hit the beach deposits now. Well, immediately above that was where most of the midden type material was coming from. Do you think that's um, actually just washed in, or do you think it's actual human activity? Oh, there's definitely human activity. I've just found a bit of bone, and there's some charcoal in there. But above that midden-type layer, we've got this two and a half metres of soil. Mm. I mean, where's that come from? Well, that's not natural. That's got to have been built up artificially somehow. 
Um, we'd need to find out when that started and when it finished. So we need some dating evidence. That's all been dumped then? That's all been dumped and I think it may well have been dumped from the castle just up there. Back inside the well cave, Matt's camera on a stick and some further excavation have exploded the myth of a secret tunnel. Follow the tunnel along this way, the trajectory actually bends down. It hasn't actually been cut by humans at all. So nobody has cleaned out this at any point, so it doesn't look like anyone's ever used it. And looking at the rock in there as well, there's no real evidence for people having chopped away at it at all. So you're saying that that tunnel is entirely natural? It looks it, yeah. And looking at the castle up outside above us, it's a good 20 metres vertically, I'd say, from down there. And this rock, as you can see, splits horizontally. And so I really don't think there's going to be any evidence at all for, uh, for it joining up the castle. So that's one piece of folklore laid to rest. But even as one trench shuts down a theory, another one opens up a whole new set of possibilities. An animal bone has been discovered at the bottom of the trench on the plateau, and it bears all the marks of early human activity. I can actually see some fine knife cuts that have probably been made with a, a metal knife. So your bone has actually been butchered by a human being with a knife. <laughs> oh, excellent. That's fantastic. Got it. And that's not the only bone that's causing a stir. Phil's doggy determination in the sloping cave has revealed a layer that could be very significant. We're getting so much bone, and it's all from this level here. Yeah. The chances of that just being washed in, I reckon that has got to be... Too, like, too coincidental. Too coincidental. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we could argue we've got occupation here. Good, good. One of the most frustrating things about this site is how much of the archaeology has been interfered with by the sea, by rusty old nails, by barbecue fires, by graffiti, by a blazing car in a cave. But at last, we're beginning to get down onto untouched early archaeology, like this piece of butchered bone, both here and in Phil's cave. Are we beginning to get to the levels where some of the earliest inhabitants of these caves actually stood? And if so, what else might we find? It's a cold, steely start to day three in Fife, and the trenches across this coastline are now producing evidence of centuries of human activity. Oh, I've got a bit of bone in here. It looks burnt. Excellent. But it's the sloping cave where we discovered unrecorded Pictish carvings that's attracting the most attention. Look at the quantity of bone, and we're getting it from right down here, right on the base of the trench. And that bone is not the evidence of, of somebody having a party here. That is somebody living here. There's just too much bone. And at the moment, the only people that we can know use these caves are the picks. So are you saying that these bones could have been dropped by the actual people who did those carvings? It, it's a strong consideration. We've got to work to that idea to start with, but what we've got to do is prove it. But Sloping Cave isn't the only place where we've found bone on our site. Our first trench over on the plateau found similar-looking evidence of occupation, although that was at least two metres below the modern surface. So to try and find out what was going on here, we're now digging a new trench close to the entrance of the well cave. Hang on, Ian. It's really loose. So it's probably fall. Yeah. This is more than just rock fall. These clean angular pieces of stone are debris from the construction of Macduff's castle in the 15th century. And that means anything directly below it will date to the same medieval period as the finds being uncovered inside the well cave. Fridge? Yeah? Are you getting all pottery over there? The bit that I'm in, we've got no pottery, we've got the odd bit of bone. But um, Alistair's got a little bit of pottery out there still from the 14th century, so it's outside the well. Whether or not this is evidence of the hermits who are meant to have lived here remains to be seen. But what's more surprising is the bridge can't find any evidence of a water source for the well that gave this cave its name. Yeah. Must be the natural. Back on the plateau, the archaeological evidence is now suggesting we're looking at a human presence here that stretches back well before even the earliest days of the Picts. 
If we begin at the beginning, yeah. and we begin with the wave cut platform here. That's this smooth rock in front of us. That's right, that was cut by wave action. And we know from the geologists that that was cut about, from about six and a half thousand years ago. So that's Mesolithic. So that's hunter-gatherer period when people are you know, not farming or anything like that? That's right, yeah. that's before farming. We've then got these midden deposits and they've been churned about by the sea. We've got a lot of shell and, and sea sand in there. But we've also got a lot of animal bone. And some of this is domesticated animals. So that's telling us that it's Neolithic. So that's after hunter-gatherer period? That's after hunter-gatherers. So somewhere in this there's a change from hunter-gatherer period to when people are actually farming. Well, yes, and that's right over the wave-cut platform. So if there was any Mesolithic, it's all been mixed up, and we can yeah. say that that lowest de deposit there is Neolithic or later. It would seem that almost as soon as this land and these caves were carved by the receding waters of the Forth, people were using them for shelter and farming. And Stuart is pretty sure where these people came from. Been having a look at all the aerial photographs and, and where things occur. There's, there's big Iron Age hill forts sort of over that area. There's evidence of a Pictish settlement over here. And beneath where we're standing on this hill here, there looks to be evidence of a possible Bronze Age burial mound. So all in all, you've got a very active, farmed, intensively occupied landscape. In fact, it's no different then to what it is today. This photograph shows it well. You've got settlement of East Weem here around this valley and the coastline, and people living here and coming up and carving the names on the caves. It's no different to what was happening in the, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, and, and in the Pictish period. It's just, I like that continuity. People are doing now what they did thousands and thousands of years ago. OK, the majority of people lived above the cliffs. But that doesn't mean that some, including Picts, weren't living down in the caves. We just need archaeological evidence to prove it. Whoa, look at that. And there's another bit there, look. Yeah, yeah. But that's, that's a cracking piece, look at that. Yeah. And in the sloping cave, Phil's now wading through a mass of human detritus. I don't think there's any doubt now that it's human occupation. <laughs> <If> <laughs> did you ever doubt it? Did you ever doubt it? That could be charcoal, pottery. We can see the charcoal from here. It's even small, very rich. small, small mammals or fish yeah, bones. Whatever. I mean, this is the real. The real answers are in here, aren't they? Well, certainly. <laughs> <are>. <laughs> Whether or not it's occupation related to the cave's Pictish carvings remains to be seen. But at the minute, these are the only proof that the Picts visited here. Our own attempt to recreate one of these enigmatic symbols, originally found as part of a Pictish hoard, has been going well. Until now. I forged it out as far as I can from the ingot I cast yesterday, but I've come to a stop now because cracks are forming round the edge uh, and I can't get a bigger piece out of it. It looks like sort of the way pastry cracks when you roll it out, but of course this you can't ball it back up again and start. No. So has the experiment convinced you that the Pictish silver could have been made using this ingot and hammering technique? Oh yes, no problem. I just needed to cast a bigger ingot. Luckily we brought along a spare for just such an emergency. But the last couple of stages are the fiddliest, with some of the inscription barely more than a hair's breadth. Victor, that looks incredibly difficult. Give me a pencil and paper any time. <laughs> And there's still no guarantee that the enamel inlay will properly fire on our makeshift forge. We've now only a few hours left of day three. And on the plateau, the diggers are almost through the thick layer of 15th century rock debris. But in the sloping cave, Phil has stopped digging. Coming out 41 centimetres from the section. Right. And then, then the slate around it. There's just too much archaeology in the trench, and some of it has to be recorded before it's removed. Okay. It's still got to be done precise, isn't it? Oh, of course it has. I mean, the, the fact is, you see, what we've done is we've got down onto this floor. This could... Where these stones are down Ah, no, no. This black stuff right at the bottom, that's the floor. Yeah. Now, see those big boulders and all yeah. have you? That's just a beach deposit which is actually coming in. That's actually protecting the floor. Oh, right. It's been marvellous. Yeah. But if you look at that level there, that floor, and you look at those carvings on the wall, yeah. cast your mind back to Jonathan's cave and, and how low those carvings were yeah. to the floor. Okay. So they could have been done. 
done by somebody sitting on that floor, in fact. Exactly. Yeah. That could well be the Pictish floor. Right. right. Maybe. If Phil's right, this would be the first evidence of Picts living in and not just visiting these caves. Are you nearly finished? Just about. I think we've just got it, yeah. That's it. But the history of the Sloping Cave is just part of a much larger, complex timeline. Down on the eroded beach, Douglas believes he's uncovered a relic from a different era of Weems' history. This is a stone. It's standing upright, a very unnatural position for it to be in. And yeah. it's actually contained within a large cut. Now, the obvious question is, who did it and why did they do yeah. it? Well, we don't have the exact answers to that now. But one thing we do know, that within the last few years, we've had two skeletons come out from this area behind us. Right. There's no soil there now because the seas eroded it all away. Yeah. And we've had carbon dates for these, so we know they're about 10th, 11th century yeah. AD yeah. and date. So it's possible that this is a stone uh, which marks a Christian cemetery. Yeah. And there may very well be further Christian burials behind this stone. But so at that's the moment, actually quite significant. Well, it's very significant. Cave. We've now managed to unpick medieval fact from fiction. Do we know how deep the well is? Well, I'm not sure if I'd want to call it a well anymore. I, th I like the word pool a little bit. Yesterday, we dismissed the myth of a tunnel running up to the medieval castle. And now Bridge has discovered that the well that gave the well cave its name isn't, well, a well. A well suggests that you're actually tapping down into the ground to get water. But this seems to be an area where there's a natural accumulation of water. Um, and somebody has come along at some point and um, cut a bigger area to catch that water. If you can see here on the sides, quite sharp edges. And if you had a naturally formed pool, you'd have pebbles scouring round and round and round and round and you'd have quite vertical edges and they'd be quite flat. We don't have that here and it definitely looks like someone has been manipulating, changing the sides. Have we any idea who made it? Not at the moment, but outside the well over there we do have a proliferation of 14th century pottery suggesting that the main time of activity here is 14th century and that is when the hermits seem to have been in this area. So we've got a hermit's pool. Well, it'd be very nice. But we've even got a stone just down here that sort of the morphology of it makes it look as though someone's been stepping in and created a footprint wear on it. There's just one drawback to your theory. There is absolutely no water in there. Well, if you look down here, there's a wee bit here, and look at the glistening of this rock here. This is where the water is seeping out and into it. But it's not enough to wash a dirty hermit. No, it's not, but it's going to seep through, seep through, and, of course, you've had a change in the water table levels. The amount of wear on the step and the effort that's gone into making this pool suggests this was a facility that was in use for a long time. It's very possible that hermits were the first people to take advantage of the rock face seeping water, but the trench outside the well cave's entrance points to other, more practical people also living in this cave. And you can actually see in the bottom of this, this deposit, oh, some lines. have got these very distinct marks, these linear dark features. These are plough marks which are going right yeah, I, I didn't here. dare to hope that's what they were. This neat bit of stratigraphy shows how much the plateau's changed in the last 600 years. At the top is a thick layer of Victorian landscaping, below which are the rocks that were dumped here when the 15th century castle was built above the caves. Then there's this layer of soil, which we now know is full of dumped organic material, bits of bone, charcoal, shellfish. And the plough marks at the bottom of the trench show that the people who lived here were putting that waste to good use. It shows us that this area of land is being cultivated with ploughs or ards in this area. So the, the great dump of domestic debris and, I suppose, food remains and everything is fertile enough. They're actually ploughing it to grow sort of crops in the top That's of That's exactly what they're doing. What sort of date do we think that is then, Douglas? Well, it's very difficult to ascribe an exact date. What we can do in relation to other layers, we can say that this material here is 15th century, and so everything below this red layer has got to be pre-15th century. Right. So this is probably medieval. It probably relates to the occupation of the caves, and perhaps anywhere before the 10th to 15th centuries. Right. And it looks like the sort of level it might be in the cave, so that it's sort of related perhaps to that strata coming out. Very much so. That's another really helpful thing about this layer. Because it's being ploughed, we can tell it was formerly a ground surface. And if we relate to that to the levels of the caves, we can see yeah. it was actually formerly quite a, a, a level um, plateau almost coming out from this grassed area into the yeah. caves. They did well to spot that, didn't they, at the bottom of that hole? That's a very good piece of excavation indeed. <laughs> it would have been very easy to, to travel through yeah. that. 
And this means that this whole part of the coastline would have once looked very different. 600 years ago, the entrance to the well cave would have been a much more welcoming prospect. And as well as providing refuge to hermits, it may also have once been home to the people who farmed the plateau throughout the Middle Ages. It would also suggest that the sloping cave where Phil's been working probably wouldn't have required a degree in potholing to enter it. Deliberate floor. What we were looking at, that brown stuff with all the black charcoal in yeah, was yeah. actually trample lying on the top of this floor. And you can see that quite clearly in the yeah, section here. Yeah. I mean, it's probably about that thick. And the stone floor itself, well, you can see it's a bit higgledy-piggledy, but it, it starts here which is part of the natural boulders. Right. And that's part of it there, that natural boulder there. But the interesting thing is when you get to here, you actually get stones that are laid in there deliberately. You can see it is a nice level surface. They've sort of leveled it up to go with the that's bedrock right. then. Do we think it's Pictish? I'd love to say it was. <laughs> <laughs> I really would. I yeah. mean, it is still at a good height for our carving. Yeah. Yeah. But realistically, I can't actually tell you. I think the truth is we're going to have to fall back on science and get a radiocarbon date. Nice. And Phil now has his proof. Subsequent radiocarbon analysis of barley grains lifted from the occupation layer dated it to between 240 and 400 AD, which covers the late Scottish Iron Age and the beginning of the Pictish period. So really we've got to leave what's underneath for somebody else, haven't we? That's too good to disturb, really. We're, we're beginning to get an idea of just by looking in the cracks of what's underneath and it, it looks like it is good, clean deposits. So, right. I mean, there may be other occupation levels underneath, yeah. but this is as far as we're going. That's nice. I like that. The discovery of this floor is a first for these caves. Proof that people lived here during the era of the Picts, the most mysterious people in British history a people who left no written records of their nation, just enigmatic and stunning artistry. There we are. Is that it finished? Yes, it's finished. It is absolutely beautiful. Well done, are you pleased? Yes, thank you. It's come out very well. I'm very pleased about that. The thing that really comes across to me is the contrast between the really high professional craftsmanship that's gone into making this is so different to the sort of graffiti level of the same designs carved on the caves here. But even these crude carvings are personal declarations of the Pictish identity. And our new evidence shows they not only visited these caves, but some actually lived here. It's now only a matter of time before the Weems caves disappear. But at least we've helped to protect their legacy. Cutting edge technology has digitally preserved the carved interiors while the archaeology we've uncovered has told the story of a coastline that's had a brief but very eventful history. Living by the sea in a beautiful spot with a good roof over your head has always had its appeal, and we found evidence of people using these caves since the earliest times when they first rose out of the water. And that evidence seems all the more important, because now seems to be the time when they're about to return to the sea.